people are dying without even having the tinfoil down. You know, they're taking it hoot and they're just dead. More than 70,000 lives are lost in just one year. These aren't caused by car crashes or war, but by a dose that can be as small as three grains of salt. We are in the deadliest moment of the deadliest drug epidemic in American history. This is why the fentanyl war is even worse than you think. Painkiller fentanyl is now the number one killer drug in the U.S. You can die just by touching it. Sun Tzu, the famous author of The Art of War, once said that the greatest victory is achieved by manipulating the battlefield so that the victory is attained without even having to fight. And it's true. Battles today go beyond just armies and weapons. Nowadays, war zones are silent and invisible. They claim hundreds of lives every year with a weapon more dangerous than any bomb, fentanyl. Just picture a drug so potent that it can snatch a life in a matter of minutes. Originally meant to help manage unbearable pain in the final stages of illness, fentanyl has turned into a deadly presence lurking on the streets of America. It's the devil's pill, man. For a person that has an addiction of 20 pills a day, uh, like, uh, you literally have to go and, and do crime. And but how did it all begin? Let's start by exploring the drugs that have played a significant role in this crisis, opioids. You can get them from the opium poppy plant, and this can be categorized into two main groups, legally manufactured medications and illegal narcotics. For instance, opioid medications like oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine, and even fentanyl are commonly prescribed for severe pain, while methadone is primarily used in addiction treatment facilities. And then there was the opioid crisis, unfolding into three distinct waves. The 1990s, we saw a rise in overdoses related to opioid medication like Percocets and Oxycodone, as doctors increasingly prescribed them for chronic conditions despite safety concerns. Now, this was followed by a surge in illegal heroin use in the early 2010s, marking the second wave. More recently, synthetics like fentanyl have been responsible for a sharp increase in overdoses since around 2013. The real issue with fentanyl is its potency. A lethal dose only requires 2 milligrams of this drug, which is roughly equivalent to 10 to 15 grains of table salt. For me, it's about 1.5 to 2 milligrams. Even in a drug user who's quite opiate tolerant, 4 or 5 milligrams can very likely be a fatal dose. But how exactly does a deadly drug like this come into existence in the first place? Well, believe it or not, fentanyl wasn't originally created by drug lords for nefarious purposes. In fact, it was synthesized by Belgian chemist Paul Janssen in 1959 for legitimate medical uses, primarily for pain management. Fentanyl is known to be 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. It doesn't last long, so you're sick again. Like heroin, you can do in the morning and you can be all good till tomorrow. Like fentanyl, you can withdraw like three times a day. 1988, fentanyl got the green light for the first time to be used for medical purposes in the U.S. But because of its use for legitimate reasons, it was considered a Schedule II narcotic, which means it faced less scrutiny compared to substances like heroin, LSD, or even marijuana. Yet interestingly, when fentanyl first started showing up in the U.S. as part of the illegal drug trade, experts noted that many people were hesitant to use it. But because it is cheaper to make than other drugs, its popularity grew. What's more, fentanyl is highly addictive, which could lead people down a path of painful withdrawal if they don't get it. Die and go through the pain of the withdrawals of these pills. But what truly made matters worse was that during the 90s and early 2000s, pharmaceutical companies began pushing opioids like crazy to healthcare providers, downplaying how addictive they could be. This aggressive marketing played a big role in the crisis the U.S. is still dealing with today. By 2019, fentanyl was one of the top 300 most prescribed meds in the U.S., with over a million prescriptions written. 2022, Ann Milgram, the head of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration (DEA), stated that fentanyl is the single deadliest drug threat our nation has ever encountered. And while fentanyl's potency and deadlines are terrifying, its reach extends even far beyond individual tragedies. It has the power to devastate entire communities and strain healthcare systems to their breaking point. This has raised serious concerns about the pervasive influence of fentanyl. The Department of Homeland Security may be considering classifying fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction, or WMD. Experts are worried that the widespread availability of this drug could be used to destabilize regions or incapacitate populations, making it a weapon unlike any other. 
The DEA estimates that 90% of fentanyl originates from Chinese companies. Now, these companies not only operate legally within China, but are also subsidized and supported by the Chinese Communist Party. Countries that, that a package is coming from is usually an indicator of, of high risk. Most of the fentanyl that we see is actually all of it that we see is from China and Hong Kong. You see, two decades after fentanyl was first developed, China's economy experienced significant growth due to economic reforms. As a result, their pharmaceutical industry exploded as well, growing at a rate of 17% annually and becoming the second largest in the world. Now, this growth was driven by lower labor costs and less stringent regulations compared to Western countries, which eventually led to precursor chemicals required for fentanyl production, being easily manufactured and exported worldwide including to the U.S. And this is why some members of Congress are now labeling the influx of Chinese fentanyl as an act of asymmetric warfare against the U.S. The illicit fentanyl that's killing people comes from China. That's enough fentanyl to give every member of the United States population a potentially lethal dose. 2022, over 107,000 Americans had overdosed, with fentanyl poisoning becoming the leading cause for ages 18 to 45. Additionally, a 2019 study revealed that prescription opioids contributed to 44% of the decrease in labor force participation amongst men. And well, in asymmetric warfare, one nation naturally aims to exploit the relative weaknesses of another. In this case, they're accusing China of taking advantage of America's demand for illicit drugs and weaponizing fentanyl. On the flip side, though, China's arguing that the fentanyl crisis is an entirely American domestic issue that is unfairly being blamed on them. They kind of say that Big Pharma's corruption, lax U.S. laws, and a culture that glorifies drug use are the real culprits. Nonetheless, there's no doubt that the fentanyl crisis has become deeply ingrained in foreign diplomacy. In 2018, during the trade war between then U.S. President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping, the Chinese government provided tax breaks and subsidies to companies exporting fentanyl as a way to retaliate against the United States. Additionally, when Pelosi visited Taiwan in 2022 against China's wishes, they halted all cooperation between Chinese and U.S. law enforcement agencies working to combat fentanyl trafficking. And interestingly, the concept of using substances as weapons against enemies isn't a new idea. China's former ambassador to the U.S. once referenced a particular chapter in Chinese history, stating, The Opium Wars initiated a century of humiliation for China. And nowadays, when reflecting on this specific era, many people believe that China is employing the same strategy that was once used against them, but now directing it towards the West over 170 years later. They're on the front lines in the war on fentanyl, and they use the same three words to describe it. A weapon of mass destruction. A weapon of mass destruction. Slow motion weapon of mass destruction. But what exactly is this strategy? And what were the opium wars? We arrest drugs. We do this because drugs are bad. Unless, of course, it's your government that's dealing the drugs. Like that time the British Empire got China hooked on opium. Spanning over several decades, from the mid-19th century until 1949, China found itself embroiled in two significant conflicts with Western powers, commonly referred to as the Opium Wars. Now, during this period, the tables were turned. Back then, the U.S., Great Britain, and France carved Chinese tea and silk. But Britain, facing a silver shortage to pay for these goods, came up with a plan. They turned to their Indian colony and suggested they started producing opium, a super addictive drug to trade with China. Selling opium probably wasn't meant to cause a full-blown crisis in China, but more like a way to tip the trade scales in Europe's favor. By the mid-1800s, we saw a surge in opium smuggling by British and American traders. Tons of Chinese silver flowed out of the country to pay for the stuff. At its peak, over 13 million Chinese out of a population of 400 million were addicted. The widespread opium addiction caused a lot of social and economic problems. And because of this, the Chinese government debated whether to make a profit by legalizing and controlling it. But in the end, they opted to enforce laws banning narcotics and warned foreign sellers they would face Chinese justice. The emperor even seized and destroyed over 1,400 tons of opium stashed by British merchants in Canton, sparking the First Opium War. Now, both these opium wars lasted almost 20 years, with Britain and France winning decisive victories. 
To this day, China still perceives these wars as their century of humiliation, a time when unfair treaties were signed that highlighted the devastating consequences of using drugs as a weapon. One instance of this is the Treaty of Nanjing, which gave Britain control of Hong Kong. One historian would even call this period China's Treaty Century, because each defeat led to major concessions to foreign powers. These treaties legalized the opium trade and granted immunity to foreign nationals from Chinese laws, which remained in effect until 1943. Now you have to know the US played a big role in that trade and benefited from the resulting negotiations. This experience likely influenced China's view on the dangers of using addiction for political and economic gain. Now, Despite the challenges, China eventually was able to effectively eliminate drug addiction for a certain period. But how did they achieve that? And can the US learn anything from it? 1949, the Chinese Communist Party took power. They used extreme measures. Mao Zedong employed harsh repression and social reforms to eradicate opium. Fields were destroyed, millions were forced into treatment, over 800 traffickers were executed, and addicts faced life sentences. By 1953, China declared itself drug-free thanks to these strict measures. Now, this historical example shows just how far a government can go to tackle a drug crisis, but it also sheds light on the potential consequences for civil liberties and human rights. It serves as a warning of what could happen to any country facing a drug crisis that gets out of hand, which could lead to calls for strict authoritarian measures. But how does this history lesson connect to the present situation? Could China, feeling mistreated after the opium wars, have orchestrated this recent fentanyl crisis to the US as payback? Well, the answer isn't that simple. In reality, a combination of events in both China and the US created the perfect conditions for the fentanyl epidemic to arise, with other major players joining in as well. As we mentioned, China used to be the main source of fentanyl entering the US, but that changed when they banned all fentanyl variants in 2019. For 2019, you could just go on the internet, type buy fentanyl in China, and a whole bunch of companies would come up. You could order it right to your door. However, China still produces the ingredients used to make fentanyl, known as precursor chemicals. And to this day, a lot of fentanyl that makes its way to the US from Mexico is made using these chemicals from China. And even though China says they're not actively contributing to the problem, there's evidence to suggest otherwise. Some Chinese companies like Wang Chang continue to sell fentanyl precursors globally to this day, including to the US, while receiving government benefits. Nevertheless, to distance themselves from direct involvement, China lets Mexican cartels handle the logistics. The cartels buy legal fentanyl products from Chinese manufacturers and then smuggle them into the US with the help of some Chinese money launderers. These are members of the Sinaloa cartel, picking up packages of chemicals that have been left floating at sea. These are the raw ingredients to cook fentanyl and other drugs. The Mexican drug cartels, especially the Sinaloa cartel and Jalisco New Generation cartel, are the ones in charge of fentanyl production. They rely on American citizens to smuggle the drugs across the border, with 86% of fentanyl traffickers between 2017 and 21 being Americans. October 2023, the Sinaloa cartel, however, hinted that they may be moving away from fentanyl trafficking due to increased pressure from US and Mexican authorities. That change in strategy was mainly influenced by the recent arrest and extradition of Ovidio Guzman, El Chapo's son, which happened just last year. That's a significant shift for them, as they are one of the main suppliers, but it's uncertain how genuine this will actually be. It is important to note that China isn't the only player in the fentanyl crisis when it comes to precursor chemicals. The DEA has recently identified India as an emerging supplier of fentanyl analogs and precursors. As early as 2016, it's known that Mexican cartels have traveled to both China and India to establish connections with fentanyl distributors. Experts suggest that when China cracked down on fentanyl production, these operations simply moved to India. Well, the historical parallel to the British using India to supply opium to China during the Opium Wars is definitely not lost. And now, let's address the crucial question. How did the United States respond to the fentanyl crisis? Well, the Trump administration was the one that took the first steps to address the issue by pressuring China politically. That led to China banning shipment of all fentanyl products to the US. Additionally, the US passed the STOP Act to prevent illegal fentanyl from entering the country through the mail. Despite these efforts, though, fentanyl-related deaths continue to rise, along with the amount of fentanyl seized by the DEA. 
China's enforcement of these controls appear to be insufficient. The more the US tried to stop Chinese fentanyl shipments, the more resilient the underground network supplying the drug became. It's never gonna stop. When one dealer gets caught, there's five more waiting to take his spot. Like, this will never stop. As long as there's a demand for pills, they're gonna keep coming. And regardless of where fentanyl comes from, it continues to cause devastation on American streets. But to what extent? The most uh, horrid, wretched, pure terror you can imagine. It feels like something slowly, like, just pulling your life force out of you, and then, you know, you're dead. That's it. Over 1,500 Americans die each week from opioids, making it the leading cause of fatal overdoses. And like we said, synthetic opioids like fentanyl are the top cause of death for people aged 18 to 45. In 2021, the death toll hit 80,411, which is more than 10 times the number of U.S. military members killed in Iraq and Afghanistan after 9-11. A study from the Mayo Clinic and Yale University also found that fentanyl deaths nearly tripled from 2016 to 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic probably made this crisis even worse. Supply chain issues made people try new drugs that are highly addictive and lethal at the same time. Also, fake fentanyl-laced pills are making things worse. Drug cartels trick people by making them look like real prescription pills. In 2022, the DEA seized over 50 million fake pills, double the amount from the year before. More than half of these pills had deadly amounts of fentanyl. In New York City this year, the DEA seized a total of 193 kilos of fentanyl, more than enough to kill the city's population 11 times over. And fentanyl's grip doesn't discriminate. It's silently ravaging communities across the country. But who is it hitting hardest? Well, in recent years, fentanyl has been the leading cause of drug ODing in all regions of the country, amongst all ages, races, and ethnic groups. But some groups are getting hit harder than others. According to recent studies, American Indians and Alaska Natives, African Americans, young adults, all die from fentanyl-linked overdoses at alarmingly higher rates. Another troubling trend is the increase in fentanyl-related deaths among minors 10 to 19, which nearly doubled from 2019 to 21. Some experts believe it's really easy to buy these fake pills through social media. The studies have found that certain groups like people with disabilities, those who have lost a spouse, renters, people without health insurance, and even military vets are being disproportionately affected by fentanyl. According to Military Times, fentanyl deaths amongst troops more than doubled from 2017 to 18, and veterans are twice as likely as the general population to die from fentanyl overdoses. Where do you think that ambulance is going to that we can hear behind us? Probably an overdose. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah this, I mean, it's, a, it's surprising is the first one we've heard. And of course, it's no surprise that a drug affecting everyone and causing bodies to pile up would have some serious economic consequences. The fentanyl epidemic has taken a heavy toll on the U.S. economy, according to many reports. One of the most shocking estimates comes from the U.S. Congress Joint Economic Committee JEC, which says the epidemic cost the U.S. almost over $1.5 trillion in 2020. That was a staggering 7% of the GDP that year an increase of about one-third since the cost was last measured in 2017. The JEC also thinks this cost will keep going up because of the increase in fatal overdoses. This money goes towards the health care for overdoses, fighting fentanyl trafficking, and dealing with the criminal justice system. Also, the loss of productivity in the workforce. It also takes into account the economic costs of lives lost to overdose and the lower value of life for overdose survivors. So what exactly is the U.S. doing to tackle this fentanyl crisis right now? Well, for years, the government has been teaming up with various countries, like Mexico being the key partner, to try and stop the flow of illegal drugs into the country. Through initiatives like the Merida Initiative, the U.S. has given Mexico around $3.5 billion in security and anti-drug aid between 2008 and 21, helping them buy military equipment and surveillance technology. The surge in fentanyl-related deaths has also caught the attention of lawmakers in Washington, and they're pushing for big changes in U.S. drug policy. President Joe Biden has made the fentanyl crisis a top priority, both at home and abroad. Fentanyl is killing more than 70,000 Americans a year. So let's launch a major surge to stop fentanyl production. 
In late 2021, Biden declared a national emergency on synthetic opioid trafficking and signed two executive orders that led his administration to punish people in groups linked to fentanyl production and distribution. And by the end of 2023, the U.S. had put sanctions on 25 Chinese companies and individuals believed to be making fentanyl chemicals. China was also added to the list of countries known for making and moving illegal drugs, joining others like Colombia and Mexico. In the midst of all of this, this administration has been putting pressure on Mexico to stop the flow of drugs coming in from China and shutting down the secret labs within its borders. They're also working to reduce the distribution of illegal opioids within the U.S. by setting new limits on opioid prescriptions and are focusing on seizing fentanyl and educating the public about how dangerous it is. 2022, the DEA seized twice as much fentanyl as the year before and issued a warning about fake prescription drugs containing lethal doses of fentanyl. In March 2023, the FDA granted approval to Narcan, an over-the-counter nasal spray designed to combat fentanyl overdoses. This development marks a significant milestone in the U.S.'s efforts to address the harm caused by fentanyl by giving us something else. We're crossing our fingers here that Narcan will prove effective in saving lives and preventing further tragedies because really, beyond all these cold numbers and statistics, there are heart-wrenching stories out there of grieving parents burying their children and futures being tragically snatched away with just a single dose. And also because, sadly, if the crisis isn't managed soon, the horror will just keep on spreading like wildfire.